you have a gun to your head. 60 seconds to decide. Which one do you think you need most? And write answers only. You have to take one of two pills. The blue pill gives you the ability to rewire your brain and transform your life in any way, shape, or form that you want. You can become the master of your mind and thus the master of your life. The red pill gives you the ability to control your motor sensory integrations, to control your body and learn any skill you want to learn at a mastery level. And I emphasize mastery. Mastery is reflected in those moments where you need your skills most, when the pressure is high and the momentum is low. The blue pill would help you unlock the true power of your brain. And finally, reveal the true answer to whether or not we only use 10% of our brain capacity. The red pill will allow you to use skill-based creation to solve any problem you have and achieve anything you want to achieve. 20 seconds to decide. Now is it going to be the power to control the body or the power to control the mind? Which pill is it going to be? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Wrong choice. There's a plot twist after all. You see, you don't need the blue nor the red pill. In fact, we all possess the abilities given by those two pills instinctively and biologically through the process of evolution. The reason it's a plot twist is because the world of neurology used to believe for the longest time that our brain's development process would come to slow down, plateau, and then stabilize. The idea of a plastic brain that can transmute its functions through late developed neurological networks was an absurd idea for neurological researchers back in the 1970s and 1980s. But then the research came out. Then came neuroplasticity, also known as the brain's plastic ability. It's the ability of neural networks in the brain to change through growth and reorganization. These changes range from individual neural pathways, making new connections and creating new thoughts, behaviors, and emotions, to systematic adjustments like cortical remapping and creating new neural networks. Examples of neuroplasticity can include any neural network changes that result from learning a new ability, environmental influences, practices, and psychological stress and factors, as defined in Wikipedia. And you see, the term neuroplasticity was first used by Polish neuroscientist Jerzy Konorski. In 1948, he observed a lot of changes in neural structures. Neurons are the cell that make up our brains. And although it wasn't widely used until the 1960s to the 1980s, that's when the research actually started developing towards creating the science of neuroplasticity or the science of the plastic brain. And you see, the scientific breakthrough changed humanity's conception on how we evolve. One breakthrough led with several dots of correlation connected to one another, led to a breakthrough in biology and in epigenetic memory. You see, our brain never stops developing. It slows down, yes, but the process of neuroplasticity is always happening. And our brain is always creating new neural networks and getting rid of old, not really used that often, neural structures. So what happens is that even though the development doesn't stop, it can slow down a bit, as you can see in this chart here. Now, in Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief, he talks about how the first six years of a child's life program their subconscious mind. After those six to seven years, children use their subconscious mind to live their everyday life. They learn not to run into the street, to hold their parents' hand in crowds, and to listen when their parents say no. Another major point of Lipton's book 
was that adults are acting through their subconscious brain 95% of the time. The other 5% of the time, that's when our conscious mind is helping us navigate through our everyday lives. This means that we are spending almost 95% of our time acting based on the beliefs we acquired as children. Now I'm going to say it again and let that sink in. This means that we are spending almost 95% of our time acting and behaving based on the blueprint we acquire as children that formed our subconscious beliefs. So in your daily life, 95% of all your thoughts, beliefs, habits, actions, thought patterns, emotions and feelings you experience are guided by our subconscious brain. And what's even worse is that we are not aware of this subconscious guidance because our conscious brain is constantly focused on creating the perceptual image of the world we live in, of, of reality, right? Let me give you an example of how your subconscious brain can be influencing your present state. Now, we all have thoughts programmed in our subconscious brain related to the concepts of personal wealth, income, and money. In a study done on lottery winners, researchers found that lottery winners are more likely to declare bankruptcy within three to five years. But how is that even possible? If you were to receive $10 million right now, do you really think that you might lose all that money and declare bankruptcy within three to five years? See, right now, most of you are probably thinking, there is no way that would happen to me. However, your subconscious brain thinks otherwise. Because you see, if you were conditioned to believe that in order for you to live an abundant life, you don't need more than four to five thousand dollars a month, your subconscious brain will guide you and steer you in a way to earn four to five thousand dollars a month. But the thing is, that's where it gets tricky. If you make more than that, then your subconscious brain will start steering you and guiding you towards spending whatever extra income you got recklessly sometimes and based on emotion just to go back to that threshold of four to five thousand dollars a month that's the comfort zone that's the survival zone that the subconscious brain got used to now when we talk about the conscious mind we talk about the creative mind when we talk about the subconscious mind we talk about the habit mind all right so keep that idea in mind first. Conscious mind is the creative mind. Subconscious mind is the habit mind. Now, Dr. Joe Dispenza in his series, Rewired on Gaia, gives you a very interesting metaphor to help us understand our brains better. So imagine you have a computer. And this computer, of course, has certain specifications when it comes to memory space, functioning speed, and utility capacity. Now, if you were to download a professional video editing software on that computer, that surpasses its function capacity. What's going to happen is, as soon as you open the software, it's first going to take a while for it to launch. And as you get used to it, it's going to start glitching and it's going to run slowly. You'll have a very hard time working on it. Eventually, you're going to end up closing the program, deleting it, as you cannot really operate, as you cannot really operate on your current computer. Instead, you decide to download a basic software that your computer can actually handle and you can finally edit your videos. But it's nowhere near as good as what you could have done if you were editing on the professional software, obviously. And you see, in this metaphor, the computer itself is the subconscious brain and the creative video editing aspect is your conscious brain. So just like the computer has a fixed capacity, your subconscious brain also has a fixed capacity, but it's not fixed by nature or biology or evolution. It's fixed by the biology of belief. Now, what created this capacity? Well, your thoughts, social influences, experiences, environment, perception, and as we said, most importantly, beliefs. These are all factors that shape the capacity of our subconscious brain. Now, let me give you a more tangible example. 
If you have a goal where you want to make $200,000 in one year, the only thing standing between you, the goal setting process and the goal achievement is simply your subconscious brain. If your computer is programmed to operate on a level where you can only make $50,000 a year, it will be impossible to try and make $200,000 a year. Your subconscious brain will create obstacles, doubt, negative thoughts and detrimental behaviors to make sure that you don't exceed that $50,000 threshold. But why? Because your subconscious brain is your habit brain. And it is very hard to try and break a habit. Your subconscious brain will not only fight for your biological survival, but also it will fight for your psychological survival. Those concepts that are rooted in the brain as beliefs. And whenever you set yourself a goal that seems out of reach, out of the comfort zone, when it comes to your processing capacity, you will not be functioning properly and thus you will most likely end up failing. And you see, this is exactly what happens when we set a new year resolution. See, why is it that more than 90% of the people who set a new year resolution would end up dropping it and quitting by January 14th? It's because they were operating on a conscious level and your conscious brain has a limited capacity. This is the first part of the answer. Yes, your conscious brain is indeed limited in, in its capacity when compared to your subconscious brain. Hence the myth that says we only use 10% of our brain capacity. Now, when you set a goal and you try to achieve it, what happens is that for the first two, three days, you are excited and motivated to achieve it. Even when you feel lazy or tired, you still gather the motivation you have and you keep working on achieving your goal. Nonetheless, your willpower is often perceived like a battery. We know that the more we use our willpower, the more it gets drained. That's why people, when they go on a diet, they will not binge on a large pizza at 6 a.m. in the morning, but they're way more likely to do it at 11 p.m. at night. That's when they use their willpower throughout the day and they got it's nighttime, they're exhausted, and they say, you know what, I might as well just do it. There's not enough willpower to steer them another direction. And this is where our subconscious brain steps in and, and it throws us off the track, right? It throws us back into our old habits, old conditioning, what we're used to. That's the habit brain. However, if your subconscious brain was also wired based on a healthy diet, when your conscious brain fails to operate and steps in with willpower, your subconscious brain steps in and takes care of the job, making sure that you do stay on track. That's just because it's conditioned for you to follow a healthy lifestyle and a healthy diet. You see, you always use your brain's capacity to its fullest, but what happens is when there's a contradiction between what you consciously want and what you subconsciously believe, then your brain capacity starts to become limited as you are going through a fight with yourself. There's, there's a quote that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. And there's a lot of wisdom in that because oftentimes the biggest enemy that we ever have to face and encounter is ourselves, is the, the guy or the girl you see in the mirror when you wake up in the morning and you're washing your face. And if you want to use your brain's capacity to its fullest, you need to make sure that your subconscious brain is working with you not against you. If you are consciously perceiving, if you are consciously pursuing a goal that goes against your subconscious, that goes against your subconscious conditioning, you will realistically only be able to work on that goal effectively about five to 10% of your day. The other 90%, your subconscious brain will try to distract you in any way, form or shape possible. And there's an interesting state that a lot of people often experience known as the state of flow. The state of flow is when your conscious brain is in coherence with your subconscious brain. And here's where it gets crazy. On a conscious level, we can process up to 120 bits of information a second, which is amazing. However, on a subconscious level, we can process up to 11 million bits of information a second. Just imagine. That's like the difference between winning $120 and $11 million. 
And a state of flow is usually stimulated by synchrony between subconscious habituation and conscious focus, a mix of emotion and skill, passion and thrill, a state in which the genius within us is deep into work. And you know who I'm talking about. This version of yourself that appears every now and then and surprises you even. You look yourself in the mirror and you don't even recognize yourself. Those problems that seemed like the end of the world were met by solutions as you were operating from a higher state of consciousness. You were operating with absolute coherence and flow between your conscious brain and your subconscious brain. Now you see, this means that no matter how old you are, what your background is or what you do in life, you can rewire your brain to learn new languages, skills, develop new patterns of thinking, habits and feelings. You can change everything within and outside just by taking control of your cognitive growth. Well, the question is how? For you to fully understand neuroplasticity, there are three main pillars you need to explore. One, neurons that fire together, wire together. Number two, if you don't use it, you lose it. And number three, neural structures are TFAR loops that provide comfort, security, longevity, and survival. If you can understand those three pillars of neuroplasticity properly, you will be able to apply neuroplasticity and unlock a potential within yourself that you don't even currently know. When you get to that point where your conscious brain and subconscious brain are working in coherence and synchrony, 90% of the time instead of 10% of the time, you will start tapping into the potential, the real potential that you have within. Frederick Nietzsche once said, He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. And you see, we as human beings, we need a purpose in life a meaning beyond the scope of life and death. Thinking about what will happen after we depart from this world, we tend to ask ourselves, why are we in this world to begin with if we are destined to leave it insignificantly? A question that has long been hanging in a silent echo chamber. What is the reason behind our mere existence? And when we ask a question, we do so because we want to turn uncertainty ambivalence or ambiguity into a logical, structural answer. But what happens when no answer is found? Tragedies, tribulations, and lots of pain. Most of it feels unfair. Hence the quote that says, Hell is a bottomless pit. Because no matter how bad a situation is, we can always find a way to make it worse. And that's not just theory. According to the National Science Foundation, an average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. And of those, 80% are negative and 95% are repetitive. When we mentioned Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief, in a previous episode, where he talks about how the first six years of a child's life program their subconscious brain, in those first six years, children use their subconscious mind to live their everyday life, they learn not to run the street, to hold their parents' hands in crowds, and to listen when their parents say no. 
Another major point of Lipton's book was that adults are acting from their subconscious mind 95% of the time. The other 5% of the time, that's when our conscious mind is helping us navigate through our everyday lives. This means that we are spending 95% of our time acting from the beliefs we acquired as children from the age of 0 to the age of 7 to 8. Let's do some simple math here. If 80% of our thoughts are negative and 95% are repetitive, and we spend almost 95% of the time operating from a subconscious level, it isn't late until we realize that the problem is not with the conscious brain. When we look at picking up maybe a new habit of reading for half an hour a day or meditating for five minutes in the morning, it seems like there's something a lot more powerful than us, a lot more powerful than our conscious brain that is throwing us off the right track every single time. And when this happens, we lose the sense of motivation and we end up dropping the habits we wanted to start. And at one point, we start looking and, and observing the problem and we tend to think that the problem is our sense of motivation or our sense of inspiration. We're not working on something we love, we're passionate about, and we always justify that as, as, as an excuse to not take action. The number one excuse that everybody encounters often is the lack of motivation. So when we don't really have a sense of motivation, we end up dropping the habits or we end up dropping the goals and the plans. So by default, the real problem here is our sense of motivation, right? Well, not really. You see, our mind is designed to help us survive and not thrive. There's a huge difference here. You are designed to move away from anything that can cause any kind of discomfort, uh, pain, or anything that can hurt you. The subconscious brain is programmed to ensure our survival as a species and also ensure procreation. Now, when we talk about a state of survival, we talk about a state of stress. And stress is pretty common nowadays. Let's actually go back to the moment where stress really starts hindering our lives. And you see that most people nowadays, when we go to bed at night and we need to set an alarm, that's when the stress starts. Especially if you're somebody who likes to hit the snooze button, you're gonna anticipate yourself feeling drained in the morning and feeling tired, maybe it's cold, you're gonna start anticipating the negative feelings that you're gonna feel the next day and you bring those negative feelings all the way to the present moment and then you start stressing. And say you went to bed, you were able to sleep and not overthink, you wake up the next morning, as soon as your alarm goes off, you start stressing. And if you hit the snooze button and you think to yourself that you're just gonna rely on the next alarm you have set up so that you don't miss work, even though you go back to sleep for a bit, you are gonna be in a state of stress. Your body doesn't wanna miss the second alarm, otherwise you might get in trouble. And this creates a lot of problems because stress itself is healthy. It's crucial for our survival, but too much stress, that's where the problem happens. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that it is important that you watch the entire video to understand what I'm saying and for you to understand what I'm talking about at the end. Because if you just skip through and it doesn't make sense, well, you skip through. So watch and listen carefully because I'm about to share with you some revolutionary stuff right here, all right? Why do you need to stop setting goals? Well, first, because you undermine it and the way that everybody's setting goals, uh, people wait for New Year's Eve to take out a piece of paper and write down everything they want to do, all the goals they want to achieve. And there is, there's a day, uh, January 17th, I think it's called Squitter's Day or something like that. You can, you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, and on January 17th, almost 80 to 90% of the people who set new year resolution goals 
would end up quitting. Why? You know, I, I was asking myself this question for a long time, like, why do we keep setting goals and we keep failing? We, we can't reach the goals, we can't achieve the objectives, and then we drop the goals. And then next year, we do the exact same thing again. The problem is, at one point, you're gonna be sick of it. I mean, you keep setting goals, and then you keep flopping on the goals, and then at one point you're just gonna say, well, why am I setting goals? It's just gonna be disappointing. I'm gonna set a goal, I'm not gonna be able to achieve it, and it's just a cycle. I don't like that. So you stop setting goals. And, you know, I was saying at the beginning that you need to stop setting goals, and I still stand by that. That doesn't mean you need to stop setting goals at all. You need to set goals in a in a way, in a way. Let, let's let's talk about it. But really, like when you think about setting goals, it's easy. Anybody can set goals. I can set a goal. I want to make a million dollars. I want to get in better shape. I want to do this. I want to do that. And what's 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 the difference? All right. Let's take two individuals. They both set the exact same goal. They both set a goal that they want to make a million dollars, all right? And one person goes out and two years later, he makes a million dollars. The other person stops working on the goal two weeks in, then sets the exact same goal again next year, and then the year after that, and then he keeps doing the exact same thing for a decade until he's sick of it and then he doesn't want to even set the goal anymore. He's satisfied with where he is and with what, we, what he has. What makes this difference? They both set goals. You see, but the person who achieved the goal didn't just set a goal. And that's why I'm saying you need to stop setting goals because anybody can set goals. If you set a goal, it doesn't mean that you're going to achieve the goal. Those people who achieve their goals, they do it because they don't just create objectives and they don't just create a goal or something they desire. They create a system. They create a system. And that's, that's fascinating because look, most people don't think about setting goals this way. They think that, okay, I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to achieve it. Guess what? It's not gonna happen. It doesn't work this way. Sometimes it does, but 99.9% .9 of the goals that you're gonna set, if you don't have a system in place, you are setting up yourself to fail. So let's, let's talk a bit more about the example I just gave you. So the first person, let's call him Mr. Rich, all right? So Mr. Rich, when he set the goal, he said, I wanna make a million dollars a year. I'm going to make that by April 24th, 2022. I'm going to do it by working on my marketing skills and building sale funnels online to sell an X product that I built. He built a system. He created an entire blueprint that he can use as a reference to monitor his progress and to move towards his goal, towards his objective. The other person said, okay, I want to make a million dollars a year and I'm just going to figure out how. I don't know how, I don't have a system in place, I just want to make a million dollars. That's my goal, I want to do it. Let's call him Mr. Poor, all right? Mr. Poor is going to remain poor unless he builds a system. The human brain works in a, in a, in a way where, you know, you have your conscious brain, you have your subconscious brain. Your subconscious brain is a lot more powerful 95% of what you do every single day comes through your subconscious brain and in a lot of references in neurology and neuroscience, they call the subconscious brain the habit brain. The conscious brain, the creative brain. So you can use your conscious brain, your creative brain to build a goal and to, to set a system and to build a blueprint that you're going to follow, but then it's your habit brain that's going to follow that system step by step to move you closer towards your goal. But if there isn't a system in place, your subconscious brain is going to be confused. There's nothing to follow. There's no blueprint to base your action upon. And it's confusing. 
and you end up dropping it. That's why Mr. Poor remains poor and Mr. Rich starts getting richer and richer and richer. It's how it works. So what I want you to do is I want you to stop setting goals. Stop setting goals and start building systems. Start building blueprints and systems. There is, uh, I don't know if you guys heard about the SMART goals, SMART goal system. And if you click on the link somewhere on the video, uh, yeah, there is, I have a course about it and you can learn more about it. Uh, but again, going back to SMART goals, S M A R T, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound or timely. See people, when people talk about SMART goals, it's a smart way to set goals. It's not a smart way to set goals, but it's a smart way to build a system. Somebody wants to go on a diet, all right? First person who keeps flopping on the diet, he just sets a goal. I wanna lose weight, I wanna go on a diet. The other person who actually achieves it, let's say he follows the SMART goal system, needs to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely, time bound whatever. He'll say, I want to lose 10 pounds by January 15th, 2021. And I'm going to do that by going to the gym four days a week. On Monday and Tuesday, I'm going to do cardio. On Friday and Saturday, I'm going to do weightlifting. And you can already see the difference. There's a system in place. You want to, you want to grow your Instagram, all right? A person says, sets a goal that they want to work on their Instagram. They want to grow their following. Another person says, I want to reach 10,000 followers by February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2021. And I'm going to do that by posting, let's say three pieces of content every day or on Monday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and one video on Thursday and an Instagram TV video on Thursday. All right. He built a system, he built a blueprint that he can follow to reach his goal, in opposed to the other person who just set the goal. And that's based on wishful thinking, and wishful thinking doesn't work. So to recap, stop setting goals. Anybody can set goals. If you set a goal, it doesn't mean that you're going to achieve it. And start focusing on building a system, whether you're following a smart goal system or any system that you build, make sure that you have a blueprint, that you have a system in place for you to go from point A to point B. I'm gonna end it with one last example. If you still need more reassurance on why this is a lot better. Let's say you went to downtown Toronto and you're in your Airbnb and you wanna go somewhere. If you know the address, you have one of two options. You can either go downstairs and start walking and try to figure your way there, or you can open your phone, put the address on the GPS and follow the map. Now, in both cases, one of them, you know, in the first case, if you don't get lost, you might end up getting to your destination. But the other person would get there, you know, there's, there's not, you can't even compare because the other one is following a system. He's following a GPS, he's following a blueprint. Go straight, go left, go right, go up again, go down. It's how it works. So again, stop setting goals, start building systems. It's the systems that are gonna help you reach the goals. Goals alone are not enough. But when you combine a goal with a powerful system, you create a massive action plan that can move you towards your goal and help you achieve the results that you want to achieve. All right, I want to welcome you all back to a new lecture. We're going to be talking about using neuro-linguistic programming to change your limiting beliefs. How to actually stop your self-limiting beliefs and eliminate them. And this is a topic that I can get very, very mad about and very passionate about because, because I believe that each and every person has greatness within, that each and every person 
that the only limits that we have in our lives are limits that we create. And I want to put a huge emphasis on this lecture because if you didn't get anything out of this course, not one single thing, but you can take one method out of this lecture and apply it to change your beliefs and change your belief system and start believing in yourself and in the greatness that you have within you, then I did you a huge favor. Because then you're gonna you're gonna see your real potential. You're gonna see that that everything you've been accustomed to, everything that you've been doing for th for the longest period of, of time in your life, that you've been just doing that because you've been limiting yourself by your own beliefs, by those self-limiting beliefs. And once you break free, you will unleash a version of you that you've never seen before. So let's talk about it. The first method you can try is to first identify negative statements you say to yourself or negative beliefs you currently have about yourself. Now this can be anything from very simple thoughts and statements where you say to yourself, I'm no good at math, I, I can't write, I can't focus to more severe statements like I'm a failure or I'm a loser or I, I'm not going anywhere in my life. And instead of those statements, instead of saying those statements in the present tense, pick up the habit of using the past tense when you ever use those statements. If there isn't a power on earth that can make you believe that you're not a failure, that's okay. Just pick up the habit of saying what you're saying in the past tense, say, I used to be a failure. Whenever there are thoughts creeping on you that saying, that saying I'm a loser or I'm a failure, just say, I was a loser. I was a failure, but I'm not anymore. And don't just say it, embody it, feel yourself saying it. When you say to yourself, that was in the past, it was in the past, leave it at the past and then ask yourself, who do you want to be in the present moment. Who do you want to be today? Who do you want to be tomorrow? And who do you want to be for the rest of your life since, since this thought or this statement is now a part of your past? Now, this is a method that you can use and it can be, it can be extremely helpful. And I'll give you an example. I, had, I have a lot of my clients who, who come to me saying they don't have a purpose. They don't have a purpose. They can't find their purpose. They want to find something they're passionate about in life and they just can't. And I asked them, well, when you do say that to yourself, what are you really saying? You're saying to yourself that you're currently not passionate, that you're currently not really driven, and that you currently don't have a purpose. So I said to them, if you do that, even if your purpose was screaming at you in front of your face, you won't be able to even notice it because you're saying to yourself that you don't have a purpose, that you don't have a passion. And I said to them, what I want you to try to do is every time you think about this purpose or this or this passion missing from your life, I want you to say that that you're passionate. Say, I used to not have a passion. I used to not have a purpose, but now I am purpose and I am passion and I feel it inside of me. It is me. And I promise you, you'd be surprised by the results. Most of the people I saw after a while they told me that they found their purpose, that it was right in front of them this entire time, but they were just neglecting it for some reason. And obviously, it's their thought processes and their, their beliefs. That's what was creating this neglect and this, and this kind of barrier between them and their purpose. And once they changed that to the past tense and they changed how they feel in the present and how they want to feel in the future, everything started to change. Now, the other system that we want to talk about is related to neurosemantic quality controlling. You want to ask yourself, does this thought serve me? Does it serve you? When you say to yourself, you're a loser or you're a failure, does this thought serve you? Does this belief align with your goals? Is it going to get me where I'm trying to get? And then answer the questions yourself. What you're doing is you're bringing you're bringing all of those thoughts and statements to your conscious awareness. And once your conscious awareness steps in, you can use your logical interpretation to wave the problem away. And I promise, as soon as you try it, you're going to notice a difference. When you have a limiting thought or a limiting belief, 
just pause for a second and ask yourself, does this thought serve me? And you're going to get the answer. It's a big fat no, it doesn't serve you. It's not going to serve you to say to yourself that you're a loser, or you're a failure. Then ask yourself, does this, does this belief align with my goals? If you want to get a promotion or you want to build a multi-million dollar company or whatever you want to do, you want to have a healthy relationship. Does this belief align with your goals? And again, the answer is a big fat no. Is it going to get you to where you're trying to get? No. See, as soon as you answer the questions yourself, you bring it to your conscious awareness and you have this moment of realization that you're going you're gonna to start asking yourself, why am I contemplating upon these thoughts if, they, if they're not going to help me in any way possible? And the second thing is to use a resourceful belief establishment. Now, once you establish that and you brought it to conscious belief that, to conscious awareness that those beliefs and, and thoughts don't really serve you, don't align with your goals, you want to ask yourself, well, what belief do I want to have? What belief would serve me and help me? And once you identify the belief or thought, ask yourself again to reaffirm it. Ask yourself, is this really the belief that I need to get to where I'm trying to get? Is this really the belief that I deserve, that I want? Is this the belief or thoughts that are going to serve me? And if the answer is yes, don't just stop there. Embody it. Embody it as in, if the negative thought or belief is you're saying to yourself, I'm a loser, I'm a failure. What's the opposite? What's the belief that you want to establish to get to where you're trying to get? Well, you want to say to yourself, I'm a success. I'm, I'm an amazing human being. And don't just say it, embody it. When you say to yourself, I'm an amazing human being, feel it. You got to feel it inside of you. When you say it, embody it. And as soon as you embody it and you feel it, you're going to feel the difference on an emotional and chemical level. You're going to feel that you're just feeling maybe a bit better, if not a whole lot better. And as you repeat this process, not only does your subconscious brain get accustomed to it, but also your subconscious brain. The more you do it, the more your subconscious brain gets accustomed and used to it. And before you know it, this one simple exercise changed your entire life. Now, the last method I want to talk about, and it's probably one of my favorites, is called the mirror technique. And I really hope you're taking notes of all of that. So, how does it work? Well, first off, you want to figure out three major negative beliefs, or maybe one, or maybe several, but not more than three when you first do it. And ideally, when you're first doing it, you want to start with one negative belief that you currently have. Then you want to close your eyes and imagine yourself in front of a mirror. And this mirror is a projection of your future. So you stand there for a second and you look at the mirror and you can see your reflection. You can see your reflection. So that sends a subconscious message that this is you. You're linking the image in the mirror to you. And then you start projecting your future into it. Now, the second thing is, as you look in the mirror and you see how your future would, would be like if you keep contemplating the same beliefs, now, if you keep saying to yourself, I'm a loser and I'm a failure, see how your life would be in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, etc. Watch it, see it, feel it. Is that what you really want? Now, the third step is to relax, get up, take a deep breath and identify the beliefs that you would rather have in your life. Now, you want to repeat the process, sit back down and look in the mirror and see what your future would look like if you start engaging with those new beliefs. And ask yourself, what beliefs do I want to allow in my life? And how do I want to truly live my life? And how do I really want my future to be? And you'll get the answer. It's not the future that you saw when you first did the exercise. It's not the, it's not the future that you projected in the mirror when you were thinking about your negative thoughts and beliefs. Uh, it's, it's obviously the future that you saw when you were saying to yourself the right kinds of beliefs and the right kind of thoughts. And this makes all the difference. Now, all of these methods that I talked about, they work better through repetition. When you first try it, you are going to notice a change on a physiological and psychological level. But if you don't repeat and reinforce, it might fade away with time. So what you want to do is repeat, repeat and repeat, because usually beliefs and thoughts 
are deeply embedded into our subconscious brain. And it is only through repetition that you can start overcoming them. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the TFAR system, a neurolinguistic system that it's not really a formula that you can use. It's more of a notion, an informative lecture that I would like to share with you because it can really change the way you think and your outlook when it comes to your thoughts, your feelings and emotions, your actions and the results that you are getting. So let's get to it. Now, if you want to summarize what TFAR stands for, thoughts equals feelings or emotions equals actions equals results. Just this one concept, if you really understand it, grasp it and start applying it with self-awareness in your life, it can change your perspective on everything. Because most people that I meet with and I try to work with, they always talk about the main problem, which is their action. I'm not able to do this habit. I'm not able to perform well in school. I'm not able to do well in my job. And they always talk about action, action. I'm procrastinating. I'm smoking too much, this, this, and that. And I'm like, I understand that action is the problem, but there's a root behind every action. There is a thought and there are feelings and emotions you don't act until you think and feel a certain way. If you don't think about something and you don't feel a certain way, you won't act on it. If you think about smoking and then you start feeling excited about it, you're going to act on it. But if you think about smoking and then the feelings associated with it are kind of like those repulsive emotions and repulsive feelings that you hate it and you don't want it, you're not going to act on it. When you think about procrastination, you think about procrastination and then you think about what you're going to do to procrastinate. So if you have some work to do and then you're like, oh, why don't I just go out with friends instead? And then you get excited and you do go out with friends. But let's say you have a deadline, right? And you feel pressured and you feel stressed and which is, which is not the kind of feelings and emotions we're looking for, but just for the sake of the example. You think about procrastinating, about going with your friends, but then the feelings that you get, what are you, what are you gonna feel? You're gonna feel stressed. Oh, you're gonna say to yourself, no, no, I can't do that. I have, I have a deadline. I need to finish this in the next 12 hours. I can't be going out with friends. So then you don't act on it. And the combination of our thoughts, feelings, and actions, they constitute and they bring us to the results that we see at the end of the day. People always think that it's, it's their actions, that actions equals results. That's not true. It is true, but it's not completed. The equation that most people follow in their life is missing two fundamental elements, which is thoughts and feelings. And when you start looking at, at everything you do in your life through the lens of the TFAR system, you start looking at actions and you start observing the root of the action the thoughts and the feelings, and you change those thoughts and those feelings, you can change the actions. And when you change the actions, you can change the results. Now, the best way to really use the TFAR system is that you need to build it. You need to build the system and then reverse engineer it. What do I mean by that? Instead of dwelling on the actions that you're taking that are you know, not what you want, Think about the results and what I'm about to explain can be broken down into two sections. And the first section I want to talk about is how do you use the TFAR system if you want to get a certain result? And the other example that I want to talk about is how do you use the TFAR system to change a certain action that you do on a daily basis or on a weekly basis or monthly basis, whatever it is. So. I'm going to be talking about how you can, how you can really use this system to change your results in the next slide. Uh, but for now, I want to explain to you very uh, quickly how you can use it as I did explain it already, 
how you can how you can really use it to to be aware of your actions and change them so basically if there is any kind of actions or habits that you're taking in your life and you look at them from the tfar system lens you will not just look at the action you will look at the outcome at at where you're heading if you keep doing the action the result that you're going to get you also need to look at the feelings and emotions that you feel while doing it before doing it and after doing the action and of course the thoughts associated with it now once you become aware you can start noticing where this pattern is being reinforced if it's the thoughts if you're saying to yourself i'm not good enough i don't have everything it takes uh, i always procrastinate whatever whatever thoughts you keep saying to yourself and and those thoughts that you actually believe and then you want to see if you are reinforcing them with emotions if you're saying to yourself i'm a failure and then you feel like a failure you feel that you're depressed or you feel that you're putting yourself down which is leading to a certain action the action is not the problem the action is not the problem it's the thoughts it's the feelings those are the really those are the real cause of the problem that's what's leading you to take the action in the first place but if you change the thoughts and the emotions then the action would change if you start saying to yourself i'm i'm successful i can do this i have everything it takes i can do it i just need to put in the work and then you feel excited and then you feel motivated you will act differently and when you act differently your results will be different so that's in a nutshell how you can use the tfar system to really look at your actions look at your habits and change them accordingly when you start looking at the elements and start identifying those elements that are reinforcing this action you're trying to avoid or even the thoughts and and feelings that are preventing you from taking a certain action that you want to take so now that we got this figured out let's talk about how you can use the tfar system to focus on results so how does it work well first off you want to fixate your conscious awareness on a result that you want to achieve maybe you want to get a promotion at work maybe you want to spend more time with your family maybe you want to love yourself more maybe you want to start working out or meditating whatever the result is focus on on a result that you want to get at the end of the day and now most people when they don't get the result that they want they ask themselves what am i doing wrong action they focus on action what am i doing wrong see but if you change your actions without changing the foundation of the action you'll be stuck in a vicious loop well if you're saying to yourself you know i'm a failure and then you're reinforcing it with feelings and then you're going to try to sit down and work and then you complain that you can't find motivation to do the work well of course you can't of course you can't find the motivation because you're not feeding your motivation with the right thoughts and right feelings and right emotions now the second thing you need to do is ask yourself what actions do i need to take to achieve the desired results usually that's where people stop right they just ask themselves all right if i want to get a promotion at work what do i need to do oh i need to work harder i need to be on time i need this i need that and they miss out they miss out on a lot of things they miss out on on crucial things we need to get to the root of the problem or in other words to the root of the action that we need to take if you don't feed the action with the right thoughts and right emotions and feelings you will have a hard time taking action and that's what happens with most people which brings us to the third step is to identify what you need to feel or how you need to feel in order to take certain action and based on the feelings you need to also identify what thoughts you want to keep and what thoughts you want to get rid of if you need to be if you need to feel confident and courageous and uh, on top of your game you can't be saying to yourself thoughts like i'm a failure and i'm a loser and i'm always late and i don't perform well at work you can't they needs all those elements there needs to be this synchrony between them they need to be aligned there's a correlation between each and every one of the elements in the tfar system that you need to be aware of and they need to be aligned and correlated and at the end of the day when they all align and they're all correlated then they can lead you towards the desired result so you need to work on the system in a way where you achieve balance and synchrony so that the tfar elements are well 
So please, stop dwelling on your action. It's not, it's not what we're doing that's wrong because this is not where the problem starts. The problem starts with how we think and how we feel, the emotions we're feeding ourselves and the thoughts that we believe. And if we change those, we can change the actions. And if we change the actions accordingly, we can change the results. I really hope that you will be able to use the TFAR system in your life because when you start using it, you will have a different perspective on, on all your actions, on, on your thoughts, on your behaviors, on your emotions, and on your results. When you don't get a certain result, you won't just look at you not taking the right action or you not being good at something and judging yourself based on that. You'll start looking at the root of the problem, at what thoughts you're feeding yourself, what emotions and feelings you're allowing yourself to feel, and then you'll be able to identify the source of the problem, work on it, and by default, if you change the thoughts in a way that matches the emotions, then you change the emotions. And if you change the emotions in a way that matches the actions, then the results will be the synchronized result of the TFAR system. I really hope you guys enjoyed this lecture and I'll see you in the next one. The first step is to pick a genius you would want to model. And maybe beforehand, I want to give you a brief explanation. What you're doing is you're picking a person who you think is living the life that you want to live, who has the emotional stability that you'd want to have, who has the intelligence that you want to have, who have the habits that you want to have. Basically, a person who inspires you, a person who would you would want to model one day, a person you'd want to become similar to and you want to first step is to pick that person pick a genius you would want to model and make sure you pick someone who you can actually know a bit about their lives whether you pick tony robbins or elon musk or bill gates or your dad or myself pick somebody that you can at least know a bit about their lifestyle and their habits and their success if you pick somebody from uh, from three, four hundred years ago in history that, that, you know, inspired you a lot, but you can't really know a lot about them. It's hard to model them in that sense. So pick someone you can actually, you can actually explore their habits and, and their emotions and, and their success in life. And the second step is to unconsciously assimilate the elements or patterns behind the foundation of this genius. Now, at first, it's not going to be unconscious. At first, you're going to start studying this person. You're going to start studying their habits, how they feel, and what they think and how they react and what they do in terms of work. Whatever you're trying to model, you would want to assimilate all the information and elements and patterns behind the foundation of their genius and their success. And once you do, you want to start working on them and you will go through the four stages of learning. The four stages of learning, they, uh, they basically create the foundation of how we learn everything. We usually start with unconscious incompetence. This is the part where you are not even aware of your incompetence. And then when you start being aware of what you want to learn, you move into conscious incompetence. You consciously know that there are some things you need to learn. There are some things that you're not competent in. And then you move towards the step of conscious competence, where you start learning the stuff and you start developing, you know, uh, you start modeling the genius or the patterns and the elements that they have. And this is where you start moving towards conscious competence. You can consciously model them and consciously replicate uh, their way of thinking and their emotional state. And you keep doing that with consistency until you get to the point of unconscious competence, where you are unconsciously competent to assimilate the elements or pattern behind the foundation of this genius or their success. And in order for you to do that, you need to practice parallel contextual training of the brain. You want to train your brain in a contextual way in the same context that this genius trains his brain in a parallel way to what he does and how he thinks and how he feels. You want to model them. 
And since you have a very clear and vivid image of who they are and what they do, then you can start indulging in the parallel contextual training of the brain. Now, if you do that, you will be able to access this NLP system. But let's take it a step further. The main idea here is that you are picking a genius or a model that represents the combination of elements you need to get to, to get what you're trying to get eventually. Then you use your mirroring ability to align yourself and form the same combination of elements, first consciously and eventually subconsciously. And here is the part where you can take it a step further. You don't need to pick only one model. You can have a role model for your career, a, mo a role model for your love life, a role model for your morals, uh, a role model for your physical exercising. There's this, um, there's this fascinating TED talk. I don't really remember who the speaker was, but what he said is usually that he said, I wake up in the morning and then the Dalai Lama is teaching me how to meditate. And then I go to the gym and I have Arnold Schwarzenegger teaching me how to work out. And then I go to work in the banking sector and I have Warren Buffett mentoring me on how to do my investments. And of course he didn't have them there with him, but he used this exercise. He used the NLP system of modeling a genius and implemented it in different parts of his life. And therefore he excelled. He's a multimillionaire and he is excelling in different parts of his life because he mirrored and modeled geniuses. If you want to be great, you got to think like great people. If you want to be successful, you got to think and act like successful people. And it's a very easy method. You can apply and you can start applying those methods on a daily basis for you to start modeling that person step by step and bit by bit. And sooner or later, you will start noticing tremendous change in your life. With that being said, I really hope you guys enjoyed this lecture and I'll see you all in the next one.